Reproductive Medicine Associates commercial, take one. RMA is a fertility center where next level science and proven treatment plans turn big dreams into big reality. Realities like me. Start your fertility journey today. Learn more at rmanetwork.com. ShopRite's free turkey program is back. Spend the qualifying amount between now and November 23rd and get a free turkey. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm the turkey and I'm free? Um, yep. Get your free turkey today. See store or visit ShopRite.com for details. Welcome to the number one podcast covering Michigan State basketball. The Final Four is not in the schedule. Join Rod and me, Eric, as we dive deep into the Spartans to get you prepared for every game. Subscribe today for in-depth recruiting updates and fantastic interviews with today's important college basketball personalities like Robbie Hummel. Thanks for having me. I, uh, I have listened to your guys' podcasts numerous times on drives throughout any Midwestern Big Ten city, so I, I am big fans of your guys' work. Jay Billis. And next time, hey, if anybody in Michigan wants a December tea time, call me. You wimps won't show up, but I'll I'll be there. I'll be there and play in the cold. And Izzo will be in front of the fire with hot chocolate. Coaches Thomas Kelly. Oh, no problem. Glad to be back, man. Glad to be back. Mike Garland. You just can't sit there and trade twos for threes. You can't do it. You're going to lose. Coming down the stretch, you're going to lose. And more. You won't find better coverage of Spartan Hoops than you will get here. For both the casual and hardcore fan, come along as we take you for a green white ride. Hey everybody, it's Eric alongside Rod here, and we're here to talk about Michigan State's 79-76 loss in overtime to James Madison at the Breslin on opening night. Oh, hard to even get through that. Uh, Before we start the show, we'd like to thank all the new listeners to the show. A special shout out to Gerald Decker, who became a monthly supporter of the show at the Scott Skiles level on Patreon. If you love what we're doing and want to keep us on the air, head on over to thefinalfoursnotontheschedule.com slash support to get links to contribute to the show via PayPal or Venmo or on a recurring basis through Patreon or Substack. Also, a couple corrections to the last show. Uh, again, thanks to Gerald Decker, who pointed out that the reason that James Madison made the switch to the Sun Belt was probably because of football. And the CA is not a FBS conference, it's an FCS conference, and so it, the Sun Belt allows James Madison the opportunity to participate in bowl games, which I hear they're kind of lobbying to do this year because they're 9-0. and uh, Finally, also... They were in the top 25. Right, yes, bowl. and they're, they're not eligible yeah. for the college football playoffs because of the you know the the not sanctions but i guess you have to be eligible yeah. for a year or two or something like that um but anyway uh, then finally i had referred to the caa as a colonial athletic association which was incorrect it's the coastal athletic association i just got thrown off because james madison founding father you know father of the constitution i was thinking of james madison and james george mason and george washington as like all colonial things so anyway all right let's discuss this um I don't know. I'm trying to find the right superlative. Uh, first of all, I guess I will apologize a little bit uh, for the, the lateness of this this post game. Usually we do it right after the game. But for a number of reasons, we didn't. One, it was really late. Two, uh, Rod was mad. Three, I was mad. <laughs> Four, we were both mad. It was a really long game. And I had to work today. And I was on call. So uh, we're going to do it a little bit late. So I'm sure this allows us some more time to reflect. Uh, which I think will, um, as you find out in aging, you know, the the best response is always not the one that first comes to your mind to, to sort of reflect for a little bit. And so maybe we'll, maybe we'll get, get a little bit more measured um, analysis than we would have had right after the game. So anyway, that's, that's my hope in what will happen here. <laughs> but uh, I would, you know, it's going, coming back from the game. I mean, it's obviously a devastating loss and, just personally, you know, just to witness, and there aren't many losses that you experience a person at Breslin, especially to a mid-major team. I, yes, we knew we we had talked before that James Ben is a good team. I couldn't really put into words how I felt. Uh, it wasn't as bad as a loss in the NCAA tournament because those always feel so. There's so much. There's a finality to it. You know, we're just you know it's all over until the next season. Mm-hmm. But it felt mm-hmm. very much like someone dumped like an ice water bucket challenge. You know, like it just you're you're shocked. 
you're speechless, you're angry. I mean, there's, you just cannot believe what just happened. And I felt like that's sort of, that was like, that best sums up how I just felt like, not numb, but just kind of like, it just incomprehensible what I had just witnessed. Yeah, it, it, it very much, I made this comment to, uh, to someone, um, today that it felt a lot to me like a three fourteen yes. loss in the NCAA yep. tournament. And, and that, I think that comparison holds true on, on a few different levels. One, I mean, look, it remains to be seen and sometimes handicapping mid-major conferences is a fool's errand, but they are the favorite in that league. And they look the part mm-hmm. for a team that could win a league like the Sun Belt. Um, as I mentioned in our preview, their coach, I think, is a guy on the way up. Um, he's done a lot of winning in his relatively brief. I think he's been a head coach for a decade, maybe a little less. And he got there kind of mm-hmm. young. So I think he's got room to grow um, in his career. But they they look the part. And then when you look at games like that, typically what happens is you have a mid-major who's really jacked and is playing well, but you have the high major, the power conference team, contributing significantly to their own demise. And usually, not always, but usually, that will come down to poor shooting. Now, interestingly, when Michigan State the, the one time in the Izzo era, I would say they had that kind of experience because um, I don't count like, you know, getting beat by George Mason. That was um, that was not a great Michigan State right. team, you know, but the one year that it happened was obviously the 2016 mm-hmm. season where MSU went in as a two seed. And a lot of people believe they should have been a number one, myself included. And then they went out and got beat by Middle Tennessee State. That was that was an anomaly because Michigan State actually shot the ball really yeah. well in that game. If you look back at how they played offensively, they didn't lose the game because they couldn't make shots. They just couldn't guard Middle Tennessee. That's unusual. The more common formula is what we saw in this game or go to Purdue losing to Fairleigh Dickinson yeah. last year. Similar kind of thing. Um, The difference is what made this more shocking than that to me is that Purdue hadn't shot really all that well all year long. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I didn't expect one for 20. Yeah. You know, no one did. We can hope. And I think we'll probably be on safe ground. We won't see a worse three point shooting effort the rest of the year. If we do, God help us. (laughs) Um, But that really is. I mean. That's usually what it takes for one of those things to happen. So that's what we got. And that's what it felt like to me, except that it was, you know, it was on home court, which makes it even harder to accept to see it happen. But I'll tell you, and I think I don't remember if we talked about this or I was talking about this with somebody else, but um, sometimes what I think can happen in these kind of games when you're playing at home is it can almost get tougher in mm-hmm. a way than playing on a neutral site or on the road because you start feeling that anxiousness and frustration in the stands can, can get on a team. You see it happen. And I thought that that, that played in a little bit for Michigan state too. In fairness to the crowd, MSU didn't do very much to 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 get them into the game positively, you know, until it was well underway. And and I want to talk about that. That's really so that's that's what it looked like to me. That's why we got this loss is it was a combination of a good team for that level playing reasonably well. Not great. I don't when you look at their their performance, I don't think James Madison comes away from that game thinking, oh, we just played out of our minds. No. But they played well. They did the things that they needed to do to win. Um, and then Michigan State contributing to it by just horrendous shooting from, from the floor and from the line and some big misses at the line from guys you don't expect to see it from. 
And there yeah. you go. But, you know, all that said, the game was still, despite all of that, the game was still there for Michigan State to win if they make a few plays. They were they they had the game late. Yeah, they had four, it. right? And they just they just couldn't make plays. And couldn't get a defensive rebound when they needed one. Left a guy open in a spot he didn't want. To, I mean, just not even a contest. But um that's what happened. Now I, I think when I go there's a several, several things that were frustrating, irritating, choose your adjective of choice. But uh, the biggest to me, where I start is at the beginning. The second time in a row, Michigan State comes out in front of a home crowd and gets punched in the mouth and doesn't respond adequately. For a veteran team with as much experience as they had out on the floor while that stuff was going on, that is maddening. And it had to be, in, well, I know it was incredibly angering to Izzo yeah. because he talked about it in the post game. He said, look, I'll play freshman. And he should. If those guys are not going to step up and play the way they should and play with energy and effort and toughness and, and match and surpass what the opponent is giving to them from jump, then they ought to be sitting on the bench when the when the jump ball goes up. Yeah. You know, that's that's how I look at it. That's inexcusable. That is missing shots. You know, some of the stuff that goes on that went on in that game. OK, it happens. But that there's no defense for there's no excuse for. And and I think that's the part that's mo. it was most frustrating out of all of it to me is that you saw a veteran team. Do it for the second time in a row. I'll tell you this. If they don't come out and absolutely obliterate Southern Indiana from jump on Thursday, then there's a real problem. And I think at that it remains to be seen if there'll be lineup changes. But if they don't make lineup changes and that doesn't happen, then there have to be lineup changes against Duke. Because you can't, you can't let that continue. You just can't. That there's just no... I, again, you can accept bad performances in terms of the skill stuff. There are games that shots will not fall. I go back to that game that nobody can seem to let go against Syracuse <laughs> in 2018, yeah. the NCAA tournament. Okay, they missed shots. That was not a game where I felt Michigan State's effort was subpar, where I felt like they weren't responding appropriately in terms of physicality, in terms of poise, in terms of toughness, this stuff, different yeah. deal. And it cannot continue. He's got a, if, if Izzo, and I would think this is the way he's thinking, if he's got a number one objective to snuff out right now, it's that, because that can't happen. You do that against Duke, you're going to be down 25 in the blink of an eye, kind of like you were against yeah, Tennessee. Right. And, and you can't, you, you know, that was the thing last night, crazily, despite that horrible start, they weren't totally blown out. I think it got to, it got to 13 or 14 was the biggest yeah, deficit. About, I think, yep. I think you're right. Um, so they weren't buried despite the fact that they had every excuse to be buried. He should have been buried. Um, but that was, that was the biggest frustration to me was that um you can then get into other stuff about the inconsistency of players and i mean we can go down the list i think the only guys who have a right to feel really really good about themselves um cohen carr despite some mistakes they were freshman mistakes and you know, I, I mentioned a few minutes ago there was a critical play in regulation on the tying basket uh, for for James Madison where Cohen was ball watching. Stephen Bardo on the broadcast pointed it out and they replayed it and it was he called it exactly right. You could see it. Uh, the ball was on the wing and it was Bickerstaff was kind of in the high post area uh, in the lane. And you see Cohen watching the ball, not his man. And by the time 
Bickerstaff is going up for the jumper. Then Cohen starts to react. It's too late. Uh, there was another play where he didn't get out to a three-point shooter. Um, but you know what? Here's the thing. One, those are mistakes that a freshman playing in his first game will make. And two, it's not his fault if if guys who are more veteran than he is were playing so poorly that Izzo correctly felt his best option was going <laughs> with a guy in his first yeah. game. So I don't put any of it on Cohen. Besides that, I thought those two plays, I thought he was really, really, really good. We saw all the things without any dunks, really. I don't think he had any. Um, he was still very impressive. Uh, you can see in that game what a difference single-handedly he can make in terms of Michigan State's offensive yeah, rebound. No question. If he gets the kind of minutes consistently that he got last night, they are going to be a much better offensive rebounding team simply because of him. That His presence alone will make them better. I thought he had a play for a lay-in with just an incredibly acrobatic move that shows you it's not all dunks, even the stuff at the rim. There's a real sense uh, and feel for the game that he's got. So hats off to him. I also thought, though he only played, I believe, 12 minutes, I really liked the way Jeremy Fears played, and I think he should have played more. I thought Jeremy Fears was really good defensively, and you know he only scored one point, and he didn't get a lot of chances to make things happen offensively. But I'll tell you what, the way that kid guards, um, if a guy wearing number 11 doesn't straighten it out fast, <laughs> I'm all for sitting his ass and playing Jeremy Fears as many minutes as he can handle. Because I'd rather see that kind of focus and consistent effort and and um, and toughness. And I'll live with the mistakes. That's me talking. I don't think Tom Izzo's quite there yet. But um, those two guys can feel really good about the way they played, in my opinion. And then, you know, Izzo said, he wasn't really all that happy with Tyson Walker. I I get what he's saying, but man, <laughs> Tyson was running on fumes. He scores 35 points, yeah. um, five rebounds. He did have two turnovers, but six steals. I mean, he he had and he had to do it. And the reason he had to do it is what's so frustrating because you got two other guys in supposedly the best backcourt in America that aren't engaged in the yeah. game. That's why he had to go out and try and score every point down the stretch. Don't criticize Izzo for the strategy. Criticize his damn teammates for not for not playing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... I mean, those guys, for the, for the most part, were completely, they were either terrible or invisible. And there's just no excuse for it. I mean, I know I'm coming hard, but there is no excuse for what we saw out of Jaden Akins and especially A.J. Hogard. Now, Izzo talked about Hogard and Walker were both cramping a lot. Uh, 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 not an excuse. Not an excuse for what we saw. I mean, this is... This is three times now, counting the two exhibitions, that A.J. Hogard has played. And um, he hasn't been good nope, yet. I agree. He hasn't been good yet. And and if this were, you know, Cassius Winston in his senior year having a bad couple of games, I'd say, all right, it, it happens to everybody. No, we've seen this movie. And, and that's why I'm saying if he doesn't straighten it out fast, I am all for and the same would go for Jaden, too, by the way. I am all for Jeremy Fears, Trey Holloman getting more minutes. If for nothing else, then, you know, we talked a lot in the preseason about how great it was that they had all these vets come back because it means you don't have to throw freshmen in there and you can hold them accountable. But it also goes the other yep, way. Exactly. And right now we're at a point from the little bit we've seen where I think some accountability needs to be applied. And to me, watching Tom Izzo for as long as I have, he typically does that with playing time. Now, I, now I suspect those guys have done enough, those veterans, that they're going to get another shot. But if they don't deliver on Thursday, 
I expect to see real changes, maybe not permanent, but real changes to get those mess that message across. Um, so other than those three guys, you know, who has a right to feel good about the way they played? Yeah. Well, nobody, I, I agree. And I, you know, I just want to kind of go over the numbers. If you, um, you know, if you were, were fortunate not having being able to watch the game and <laughs> didn't have to witness it. I think that the important thing, as you mentioned before, James Madison. So in the Tennessee game, Tennessee, I think in that 17 to one blitz to start the game, they were shooting 80%. James Madison was not right. They were not like making everything. They, they uh-huh. had plenty of times that had empty possessions down the court, but uh, Michigan Sages could, was, uh, you know, incapable of scoring. Uh, James Madison finished the game shooting 30, a little under 37% from the field, 27.6% from three, 75% from the line, not like world-beating numbers. They had 14 offensive rebounds for a 33% offensive rebounding rate. Uh, nothing like crazy good. But I think, you know, the, what? just look at the Michigan State numbers. I think it really, I mean, obviously they shot poorly. And there's, you know, we know that. Uh, you know, Walker was 12 of 26. Hogard, 2 of 11. Aikens, 2 of 10. Hall, 2 of 12. Uh, Sissoko, 2 of 3. Carr, 5 of 6. Hallman, 1 of 3. But, you know, the... Tyson missed all five threes. He missed Hogard missed all four. Aikens over four. Hall over four. Uh, the only one he hit is you know the sniper Trey Hallman, right? <laughs> uh, and then you know Walker Walker hit eleven of seventeen free throws, but three of those were front ends that he missed. So he you know you could almost say he's eleven of twenty. Uh, the only thing Hogard did was hit the free throws. So and I and I think uh, it really just all those numbers to me, yes, they didn't shoot well, but I think it really goes along to what you said about the beginning of the game. I think just a reflection of just a lack of focus and, uh, you know, intensity or whatever it is to, and just sharpness. They just weren't sharp. They didn't, they kind of, I don't know, lack as a days ago. I don't exactly know what the term is, how you could be that way in your opener, but that is how they played. They played that way shooting. They played that way on defense. And that's usually where we see it. Michigan State, when you have the defense, that's not really dialed in. This is kind of what you expect, and then it affects your offense. And then, and then to your point, absolutely. I mean, everybody, you know, once you you've had six or seven misses from three, then it's just contagious, just like it is from the free throw line. And you entirely expect more people to miss of more, you know, threes or whatever. And I remember a year a couple of years ago, and I don't remember it's a year where Travis Trice was on the team. I don't know if it's his senior year or his junior year, but they just I think the splits home and away for free throw lines were pretty stark it was like 20 percent worse at home than they were on the road and i think it was partly because you know it's that every you know you can hear the collective get you can feel it in the arena as everyone just gets extra quiet like more than usual and it definitely got that point in the second half i uh, and so i think all those things just it just shows that the i think it's a lack of focus which is really surprising for a team that not only shot well but that seemed to be usually dialed in. Not every game last year, and that's you know partly because we always would talk about AJ sort of kind of uh, ran the show, and that sort of that sort of led the team. But it's uh, super disappointing. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I again, I well, and, and I put it I put it first and foremost on him. You know, yeah, he's a point I, guard. I, that's what you'd say. Perusing, yeah. that's it, and peru and perusing. Um, Are you aspiring to attend your dream college but struggling in your AP classes? No need to worry because the Princeton Review has exciting news for you. With over 40 years of experience and having served millions of AP students in the past five years, the Princeton Review can confidently assure you a perfect five score on your AP exam with their AP5 tutoring. And here's the best part. It's a guaranteed result or your money back. The Princeton Review is offering an exclusive $500 discount. Simply use the promo code SCORE5 at PrincetonReview.com for a perfect AP. The talk among Michigan State fans last night and, and today, there's been a lot of talk about Malik Call. Right. It's it's so far beside the point that I, I get it. Malik's been inconsistent in his career. Okay. And the, it's not just that he missed those three point shots last night, it's that they looked really yeah, bad. He passed out the I get it. Ones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I get it. But if you think that was the biggest takeaway from that game, you're out of your damn mind. You don't understand what you're looking at. The biggest takeaway from that game, in my opinion, is that your senior point guard, who is supposed to be the floor leader for the best backcourt in America, <laughs> has played like absolute sh- 
three games in a row, and it's nothing new. We've seen this before. So I I just I, I, I hate to come down that way on a Michigan State player. Uh, those who listen to the show know I don't do it very much, but I am really, really, and this is a day later, and I still feel it. <laughs> yeah. I'm very, very frustrated with watching that. Yeah. You know, watching the mistakes, watching a senior leader <laughs> foul a three point shooter late in the game when you're trying to close it out. Um, not seeing him do the things that we, okay, your jumper's not falling. Do the things that you're capable of doing. Get to the rim. Focus on that. Create for others off of that movement, off of that action. Nothing. Nothing. It, it Defensively, you know, they, they tasked him a lot of the time he was out there, particularly in the second half. He was guarding uh, mm-hmm. Edwards. He didn't do very much to stop him. I know that. Um, it, it starts with him. And if you think that's unfair, I, I don't know what else to tell you except that, generally speaking, a Michigan State team is going to go as far as its point guard goes. And last year's team went to where they did, not coincidentally, in the best three-game stretch of A.J. Hogarth's season in the NCAA yeah. tournament. So you tell me, and he's in his fourth year, his third year as a starter, enough's enough. Yeah. He's got to know what he's supposed to do. Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't see, I didn't see that stuff from Cassius Winston. I didn't see that stuff from Travis Trice, Denzel Valentine, Keith Appling, uh, you know, on and on and on. There's no excuse for it. If, if you want to be the guy in that role at this school, that is the standard. And if you can't match it, see you later. Yeah, well. And I don't mean that literally, but what I do mean is at that point, in my opinion, if it keeps going, there is no reason in the world not to play Jeremy Fears because whatever mistakes Jeremy Fears might make, one thing I know is he is going to be locked in. 100% of the time he is on the floor. You are not going to see those mistakes where you, you just you slap your forehead and say, how, where is the focus? Where is the energy? You won't see that with him. You might see, you will see him make mistakes, but they're going to be mistakes of commission, not omission. Yeah. And I can live with that. Well, let's, uh, and I, and I think Tom Izzo will too. Just talk about the brothers of just you gutters. Uh, they are, a sponsor of the show, they were the, the player they had to keep in the gutter. Michigan State was Terrence Edwards, which clearly they did not do. Uh, if you need gutter work, make sure you check out the Brothers of Justice Gutters. They do fantastic work. We've got all kinds of rain in the state of Michigan. Make sure you have them come out, repair, replace, clean out your gutters, whatever you need done. They only do gutters. They do a fantastic job. And they are a fantastic sponsor of the show. If you're on the west side of the state, Kurt and his team will take care of you around the Grand Rapids metro area or Holland, uh, Sagatuck. Or uh, Kurt and his team... Or, Sorry, Greg and his team will take care of you out in the east side of the state, in the metro Detroit area, so a much larger area as well. They can do everything. Uh, 10% off, you mentioned Final Four. Your contact information is in your podcast player below, or if you want to check out the episode page on the website, you can do that as well. Uh, so, you know, the, the player they were supposed to shut down was Terrence Edwards, and I would say he had a good game, not a great game. He wasn't, like, amazing. He was 5 for 13 from the field, 2 for 5 for 3, 12 for 13 from the line, so very good there. 5 off and 5 rebounds. Uh, three assists, four turnovers, 24 points. But they were really, uh, you know, he was the, the I guess the, the he would score when they needed it, right? And that was the difference. I, that was, uh, that was, was real. He's an impressive player. And so he was clearly a player they were unable to contain. And he's a, you know, he started most Big Ten teams, I think. Yeah, he had a, he had a nice night. But I'll tell you the other thing that really grinded, grinds me about that game. Um, and he's he brings it to mind because he was one of them. Edwards and Michael Green, their, oh, yeah, their point guy, guard, yeah. mm-hmm. both. And I don't know how much you could tell of the stance, but they ran their mouths all night. They talked all night. And for for Michigan State to allow guys like that and a Sunbelt team to come in and run their mouths. And not get it. Just 
I, I watched it and I thought to myself, Anthony Smith has just got to be ashamed. <laughs> I'm sorry, Smith, Antonio. Yeah. Smith. <laughs> I'm so angry. I'm <laughs> Antonio Smith, it, it, Xavier Tillman, Draymond Green, Travis Walton. Just humiliated by that, that they didn't respond. Are you kidding me? With the Planet Fitness Black Card, you don't just get a great workout. You get a great perk out because your membership is packed with perks. For only $24.99 a month, you'll get perks like access to any of our 2,400 clean and spacious locations. Bring your friend anytime and both work out with tons of equipment that'll give you that big fitness energy. Relax in the Black Card Spa for a pampered perk and download the PF app for plenty more perks. Work out and perk out with the PF Black Card. Join today for only $24.99 a month. See Home Club for details. That it's just it's you can you can talk about the the counting numbers and the statistics in this game and all of that and there's of course value and meaning to all that stuff but the the stuff that was most troubling to me way more than any of that because I think a lot of that is down to okay it's one night and you didn't do these things well and that won't always be the case but man, when when you come out and you get punched in the mouth, and then you got a guy telling you about that, guys telling you about that, and you don't respond, because we all know what a response looks yeah. like from Michigan State, and we didn't see that. You could you can argue that Tyson Walker responded, but he's the only yeah. one that that shouldn't ever happen. That is troubling. That is the stuff that was deeply, deeply troubling. And they better get that fixed fast, too. Well, let's go on to the five keys of the game, I suppose. Uh, this is brought to you by Nudge Printing. Nudge Printing, if you need collegiate or Michigan State apparel, other schools in the state of Michigan outside of the University of Michigan. Uh, no one is uh, better equipped to provide that for you except Nudge Printing. So you go to nudgeprinting.com. You get 20% off your order if you... Uh, mention or type in final four uh, as a coupon code at checkout. Uh, you can get high quality screen printed hoodies, t-shirts. Uh, they have lots of decals for cornhole or for your wall. Uh, all really great quality stuff. Michigan state grads, Gabe and Brittany, they do fantastic work. They also have a, not a nonprofit, but one that works for uh, setting up doing graphic design for maybe your business or your family or your school. Uh, they're actually helping with our family as well for um, our robotics team at our, at high school. So uh, great prices, and they make all the things really easy to order. So that you order your, you just have them open a store online. Everyone pays them. They ship everything out to everybody. There's nothing for you to do, <laughs> except you just get uh, whatever you decide to set the prices for to raise money for the fundraiser. So anyway, it's great. FabricatedCustoms.com if you want to get uh, into that. So first key of the game, well. I mean, it's focus. I guess we've pretty much beaten that that horse to, to death. Mitch say clearly just completely lacked focus and never really even ever got it. Shameful. I mean, yeah. Shameful. <laughs> the, the only thing you can say, um, they had 11 turnovers in 45 minutes. They weren't kicking the ball no, and around. James Madison forces turnovers. They so, weren't. And, and so that was, you know, yeah, they do. And so and so I, I give Michigan State a small amount of credit for that. But in every other way, total yeah. failure. Uh, so second key to the game, turnovers. Well, we just kind of mentioned that. Uh, that Actually, I think they turned James and Madison over, although you could almost argue it was Tyson Walker turning them over <laughs> with all his steals. Well, they had what they have. Uh, James Madison um, had uh, 15 turnovers. They Michigan had, State uh, had 11. Had 15 turnovers. A number and, of those were, you know. Uh, I. And eight yeah, steals. There must have been like three so, illegal so, screens by Michigan State too, especially I feel like in the second half. So most of the yeah. bad balls. Yeah, turnovers. and let's 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 have a let's have a discussion. We're gonna step away from the keys yeah. for a second. Um, the uh, the way that game was officiated, and and again, do they call fouls in that I'm game? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that it was what cost Michigan State, because Michigan State deserved to lose. There's no doubt yeah, about that. Agreed. For all the reasons we articulated. But that was a truly terrible job of officiating. Um, if you are going, uh, you know, I've said this for a long time. 
one, I, I would really like the idea of a foul to actually be what it was designed to be, which is a play that um, gives an unfair advantage to one side or over the other and not the technicality of a, of a, of a rule quote unquote. Um, but uh, that's a losing battle. I understand <laughs> yeah. that. So, so with that said, you'd at least like to see consistency. All right. If you can tell from jump, all right, they're calling it tight. Then at least you have a chance to adjust, but the number, the ungodly amount of fouls they called in the first half and for part of the second, and then they just swallowed yeah. their whistle. And for as many, for as many free throws, what did Michigan state shoot? They shot, uh, 30, 17 for 31, 37, 37 23 for 71, 37, 37 free yeah. throw attempts. Well, I'm, I'm more, I'm more interested yeah, in the 37. attempts, 37 attempts. And as you mentioned, they missed a number of front ends of one-on-one. One one. It could have easily missed, been over 40. They missed five 40. of the six one-on-ones, I think. <laughs> okay. So could have been well over yeah. 40. They probably should have had well over 50. And, and with with the way the game had been right, called. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and look, make no mistake, man. James Madison was physical. They That was not a case of... Well, these guys are just calling anything. They're calling it when you breathe on somebody. No, no, no. There was real physicality to it. But you have to call it the same way. And the inconsistency is is what is uh, among all the, you know, the parade to the free throw line nobody wants to see. But if a team's going to play that way, I mean their their defensive approach which uh, I I got to hand it to them it worked. Um, reminded me of what a lot of critics used to say about Tom Izzo's early teams or um, Mark D'Antonio's pass defense when he had the mm-hmm. no-fly zone going, which is, well, they're going to foul or commit a penalty on every play and dare you to yeah. call it. That's kind of what James Madison did. I mean, they were just physical, and I'm being kind in using that word, but Truthfully, there should have been even more free throw attempts if they were going to call the game the way they did in the first, say, 25, 30 mm-hmm. minutes. They they didn't after that, and that was very frustrating to see. Because uh, you just that's the one thing you just you ask for that. Ask for consistency, you know? Yeah. All right. So third key to the game, rebounding, and this is uh, you know, uh, this is a hard one to evaluate. Eh. I mean, I think because so well, okay, so it was me. fifty-one forty-eight. Not James Madison me. had more rebounds, but I would say that the one thing I would say in Michigan State's defense of rebounding is that when you miss so many free throws, you're not going to ever re- you almost never offensive rebound those. Michigan State's offensive rebounding rate thirty-seven percent. I think you mentioned largely in uh, part due to um, Cone Carr. Malik Hall had four of them as well. Aikens had three. Aikens had a lot of rebounds. That's one thing he he did. Um, but they got, yeah. they gave up key offensive rebounds uh, to James Madison, James Madison, at that, 33%. That's it. That's it, they're it. just critical times, right? It's like, you know, uh, that's it's, it. Edwards doesn't score a ton of, he doesn't like shoot great, but he hits him when it matters. Like, you know, the Rebecca staff are the same thing. Um, so, you know, it, inexcusable to get out rebounded by that team. Again, it just shows a lack of focus, but, um, I don't know. I'm not concerned about the 51 to 48 raw rebounding numbers. Don't mean very much. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and the offensive rebounding was yeah, solid. 37 is pretty good. I'm Should not, have been maybe uh, better, that but... was, that was, and, and it's the second game in a row because they did a really good job against Tennessee. So if you're looking for silver linings here, that's yep. one is that it looks like Michigan state really does have a legitimate chance to be a better offensive yeah, rebounding I think so. team. And I'm telling you, that's going to be important because, and I don't know how, let me look at the, what the numbers were. Well, they had a decent production on that. Um, so 17 offensive rebounds, 17 second chance points. You'd like that number to be a little higher. I would have preferred it to see at least in the low mm-hmm. 20s, but um, that's progress. That's a start. So that's fine. Uh, and they can use that because, you know, we've talked about 
when you don't have a solid low post game, you got to generate points inside right. the arc somehow. And that's one way you can do it is second chance baskets. So that's good. But the defensive rebounding was just not nearly yeah, good enough. I agree. You mentioned inopportune times, but th- th- even apart from that, um, it just wasn't good enough. So the fourth key to the game, the fives. And so we thought there might be some opportunities for uh, Soko or Cooper to get going. And that yeah. uh, just really didn't happen. Um, both of them. No, they got, they got hammered. Yeah, I, I mean, Bickerstaff just cleaned everybody's yeah. clock. Um, disappointing to see, you know, Marty in a couple of moments, but uh, he and Carson both. I mean, look, the, the, the proof is in at the end of the game. The, neither of those guys were on the floor. It was Cohen Carr yeah, at the right. five. I bet nobody saw that coming, but that's what we saw. Um, and it was the right move, by oh, the yeah. way. So those guys have really got to regroup. Um, you know, I, I I'm not I'm not ready to I, I particularly in Carson's case, I think there's a lot more to come. But um that was a disappointing effort. And I will tell you this right now, not so much Thursday night. But next week, when they're facing Duke, those two guys have got to show up. They have no chance if those guys don't play well. And I don't mean scoring a bunch of points. I mean play yeah. well. A Michigan State's pick setting, you know, you talked about all the offensive fouls, but even apart from that, they did a terrible job setting screens. That was part of the problem offensively for MSU, in my view, is that they just did not do a good job screening. And and while that's a team-wide thing, the a lot of that is going to fall on your fives because they, Michigan State's offense, they typically use the five-man to do sometimes the four, but often it's the five to do a lot of those high ball screens. And they just didn't do a good enough job. So, yeah, really not good from either guy, and they got to be better. Yeah, I I feel like the one thing that James Mattis was doing is that they're really aggressive hedging on the on Mahdi and making it you know impossible for the ball handler uh, to really get to do much. But that's how you your counter to that is just is breaking to the basket, right, and just and slipping past and. Yep. They, look, I want to give James, you know, a lot of this uh, obviously our focus is on yeah. Michigan State's failings, right? I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there were things that James Madison did very well. Offensively, I thought there were times in that game where they did the kind of things that I would expect Michigan State to do. So we mentioned Cohen Carr having some defensive issues late, right? Well, part of that was that James Madison saw him and attacked him. That's what veteran Mm -hmm. teams do. You'd like to think that a team that has all juniors and seniors basically (laughs) in its starting lineup would be able to do that, but we didn't see as much of that. The second thing I thought James Madison did really well is I thought they played a pretty good game defensively. I I still criticize a lot of what MSU did when they had the ball, but James Madison and their ball screen defense, I think you're right. They did a good job aggressively hedging, but you know what else they did? is it did a pretty good job of staying in contact with the roll yep. man. You could criticize our fives for not doing more, but James Madison, I thought, did a pretty good job frustrating that. They also did a pretty good job at limiting penetration, although, again, I think some of that was down to MSU not being assertive enough, A.J. Hogard. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the best, clearest sign of that is Michigan State had 26 field goals and uh, 13 assists. Yeah, A 50% assist to field goal ratio is a pretty good sign, and it was a similar thing in the Tennessee game. Um, When you see numbers like that for Michigan State, not for every team, but for Michigan State, when you see a number like that, that is a sign that they did not get their offense rolling. They got turned. They got turned into. It was stagnant, and they got turned into a lot of one-on-one situations. And they are lucky. They are incredibly fortunate that they have a guy like Tyson Walker on the roster this year, who is capable in those moments of going and just getting a basket. 
So they do have a fail safe that can kind of keep you afloat a lot of the time, even if that's happening. But man, you don't want a steady diet of it. So give James Madison a lot of credit for that. Give Michigan State a lot of blame for not finding ways to run their offense more fluidly. Well, and the fifth key to the game was AJ, and I think we've again that's another one we talked plenty about. Then super disappointing, and uh, yeah, I don't. You know, I know it sounds terrible, but it's the the proof. I mean, two for eleven from the floor, three assists, only one turnover, but three assists. Yeah, I mean, you could say, well, that's because no one could that's shoot. An so that's part of the problem. You're not going to assist to. Yeah, you know. yeah, but but man, when when it counted, I did not feel that he was doing the things he has to do to make others yep. better. The buck stops with the point guard at Michigan State. Bottom line, and. You know, it's guess what? It's going to be a key against Southern Indiana. Spoiler alert. <laughs> there it is. It's going to be another key until one of two things happens until he gets focused and locked in again, or until Michigan State makes playing time changes that it doesn't matter yeah. as much. One or the other. Well, okay. So we've had over 24 hours to sort of uh, contemplate the game. I mean, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the frustration is still there, but I think, you know, that the other, the key is, of course, it is one game. It is the first game. It is not, the season is not over. The sky is not falling. We have every reason to believe that this team, which is largely the same team as it was last year, you know, for the most part is not going to continue shooting 5% from three points. They're not going to be this terrible from the free throw line. Um, so, I mean, and there are, there are signs, as you mentioned, that the rebounding looks better. So I think, you know, it may be that we largely forget this game <laughs> later in the season. I mean, that's my hope that this is not a, I hope so. I right. hope so. And, and look, it's, I, I, I can tell you this and I'd, I'd have to go back. I'm sure there have been the occasional loss to a team like this in a year where Michigan state didn't do the business at the end, but you know, the national championship team lost to Wright state, right? Um, it wasn't on TV. Jim Camperoni was talking about that today. It wasn't on TV. I remember listening to it on the radio and being absolutely shocked. <laughs> and it was without Mateen Cleaves, but still, um, the fact that it wasn't on TV maybe muted that a little bit. But that was that was and they were terrible. They were not a good team either. It's and not, yeah, and right. And the uh, fourteen fifteen team lost to Texas. I Southern, was there at that game, that which had people yeah. on the. <laughs> had people on the Spartan mag board, supposed Michigan state fans, uh, mind you trying to bet people that Michigan state wouldn't make the NCAA tournament. Well, <laughs> they went to a final four. Um, and by the way, Texas Southern made the NCAA tournament that year as well. So they weren't, so it might be, might end up being a decent comparison for this game. If James Madison does as well as people expect them to. Um, so all of, all of that is to say, no, of course, this does not obliterate everything else that you believed was the case. And by the way, a lot of which was was on display against Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, let's not forget that. So but but again, the, the part that's troubling to me is not the shooting from three. It's not the shooting from the line. It's not those things. It's the responses to adversity, the way that guys do not come out from the opening tip locked in. If Michigan State played 40 minutes with the kind of effort it played over the last, say, 30 in both the Tennessee game and in this game, Michigan State wins. Right. I have oh, no yeah, doubt sure. in my mind. None. So why is that not there? And why are you having to beg juniors and seniors to figure that out? That ought to be figured out by now. Those guys have been around the block a few times, you know? Um, so, and, and don't give me any nonsense about, well, 
you know, they've got to realize that they're the hunted now. They play at Michigan State. They're the hunted every year. When the mid-major comes in, you're automatically hunted. That doesn't hunted. change. <laughs> every one of these guys, for every game they've ever played at Michigan State, they're yeah. the hunted. That's how it is. So those are the things that are troubling to me. Is that fixable? Sure, it's fixable. But I, you know, now that I've seen it two times in a row, I need to see the converse. I need to see this group decide that they're going to play with that kind of effort. The shooting's going to work itself out. I'm there's I've seen some and it's to be expected when you have a one for 20 performance, you're going to have yeah. people to start the season too, know, right? Yeah. Bernie, Bernie, bringing, bringing out the sepaku <laughs> accoutrements. Um, it's, it's, I, I just don't think that's going to be the case. We got too many guys with too much under their belt to believe that. But, but this other stuff is much more troubling to me because that's controllable. And that's the kind of stuff that this program, it's so far removed from what this program stands for that when I see it, that's jarring to me in the same way that I guess one for 20 is to other people. That's the part that I'm locked in on. Yeah. Well, and so they got to solve that. I agree. And it, and my, my hope is that they will have, you know, ha ha, it's an exhibition game. And then you come back and like, Oh, this really matters. And so now we, this, you know, you know, why do seniors need that reminder? Uh, who knows? But my hope is that they come back and they are focused from here on out, recognizing that if they don't play, they can't just roll the ball out and, and, you know, roll over people. So that's my hope that this is a minor blip and we remember this and then forget it because it's not important as we start rolling along entire, entirely possible. And you know what, if they learn the right lesson from this, then it's worth right? it. Right. For sure. If we, if we, if we never see that kind of half start again, this season, and I mean that from an effort point of view, you can miss shots, all that, but from a focus and, and an effort point of view, if we never see it again, then it's worth taking that loss. Yeah. Yeah. You it much better in November than in March for sure. I mean, <laughs> without a doubt. All right. Well, let's wrap it up there. We'll be back with, uh, back soon with the preview for the Southern Indian as we have a quick turnaround here. Um, just a reminder again, if you have not yet subscribed to the show, please subscribe in your podcast player. Check out Nudge Printing at nudgeprinting.com. If you need gutter work or if you're for your home or your office, check out the Brothers at Just Two Gutters at brothersgutters.com to find a, um, a franchise near you. And then uh, if you have not yet emailed me at eric at tffinots.com, uh, Shoot, shoot over your standings for 1 through 14 for the Big Ten in the Beat Rod Contest for win some uh, nudge gift cards. Uh, you can do that and make sure that you have your name. And then we're going to use the seating numbers based on the Big Ten uh, for the Big Ten tournament. And just put the, for a tiebreaker, how many points do you think uh, Michigan State scores against Michigan this season? Well, I guess we'll just wrap it up now. We'll, we'll put this, uh, we'll burn the tape. How does that sound, Rod? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> All right. So until next time, the final four is on the schedule. Go green. Ew. Gotta get rid of this old Backstreet Boys t-shirt. Tell me why. Because it stinks, boys. Tell me why. I've washed it so many times, but the odor won't come out. Tell me why. No, you tell me why I can't get rid of this odor. Have you tried Downy Rinse and Refresh? It doesn't just cover up odors. It helps remove them. Wow, it worked, guys. Yeah. Downy Rinse and Refresh removes more odor in one wash than the leading value detergent in three washes. Find it wherever you buy laundry products.